but you know coming from different places maybe you're uh, in the morning in the afternoon um, but uh, thank you for taking the time to uh, attend my talk hopefully there's something here um, that I'm sharing that can be uh, useful to your career uh, as you uh, enter into the field of machine learning and AI so the topic for today is around deep learning applications in ELP and conversation AI at Uber um, uh, just a little bit of background about myself um, so that you know who is talking. Um, I got my uh, undergrad degree in physics from China, uh, University of Science and Technology of China. Um, and I, I did my PhD also in physics, uh, specialized in quantum physics, quantum computation uh, from Duke University. Um, I also did a, a postdoc research at a Yale University working on uh, similar stuff in quantum computation. Um, gradually moved to uh, the problem called quantum error correction, which is uh, one of the well-known sort of uh, road blocker for realized uh, large-scale quantum computation. Uh, three years ago, um, I decided to move to the field of machine learning and AI. I started to uh, work um, uh, at Uber and working on deep learning, ALP um, applications and uh, research as well. Um, more recently, I, I got involved in a conversation AI effort so right now, I'm a tech lead on the conversation AI team, uh, driving some of the uh, major applications as well as uh, cutting research, cutting edge research. So feel free to uh, interrupt me uh, in the middle of the talk um, because uh, in this case, I don't see your face. So I really cannot see you know, whether I'm doing it too fast or too slow. Just feel free to jump in and ask me questions you know, uh, whenever you have. So let me motivate the talk. Um, Basically, um, when you think about you know AI um, or you know machine learning and apply that to uh, industry problems, it typically involves three different sort of components, major components. Of course, you know you all know that you know the the thing people talk most about is the you know the AI technology, right? Uh, it's the uh, um, it has been the like the um, hot topic in the past uh, five to ten years. So when you talk about AI, it's um, people think about you know supervised learning. You talk about you know reinforced learning. You talk about you know language model with pre-training. That that's a big deal last year for um, NLP. You know all these um, pre-trained models, you know, BERT, you know, uh, Axionet, stuff like that. And you talk about you know GAN models, right? Generative adversarial learning, all the stuff. You know, um, it's very exciting uh, in this era. You know, you see all these you know advancement in AI, which is really great. Um, on the other hand, you also think about your know, application, right? Where do you plug your AI technology into to, in order to generate um, values? Specifically, you know, um, there's a lot of field which has been rev revolutionized in the past few years by deep learning because things are kind of impossible or not good enough in the past, not become possible or available to, uh, to uh, commercial systems, for example, speech recognition which is really um, poorly done in the past. You know, uh, people cannot really uh, push it to the limit that it can be useful for any uh, commercial use cases. But deep learning really um, um, pushed through that and made the change. Now it's good enough that it actually you can do all kinds of you know, speech applications in virtual assistant, for example, you know, uh, Alexa, you know, Google Assistant, all the stuff. You know, if you don't have the good speech recognition system, it's simply impossible. You know, self-driving cars is another um, big uh, hot area people uh, um, push AI into. Uh, face recognition, machine translation, you know, virtual assistant, anomaly detection, you know, you name it, you know, all kinds of applications. And lastly, um, there's also the uh, system component, which I think typically is overlooked. You know, people typically, you know, don't talk about this as much, but it's super critical because even if you have the best AI technology, you have the um, most um, promising application which you can use, but if you don't have the right system to hold such a, uh, technology, such application, uh, nothing will um, turn out to be great, right? It won't work in reality. You know, when we talk about system, we talk about you know, Hadoop, we talk about Spark, TensorFlow, um, Kubernetes, and all kinds of infrastructure to host this kind of AI application. So at the end of the day, it's really uh, if you are doing um, machine learning or AI applications, it's about this, the, this you know, interplay between all these three uh, components from the technology point of view. Of course, there's also uh, other stuff you, know, uh, you, you will encounter in uh, daily life if you are doing AI application, 
you know, um, but uh, from technical point of view, probably these are the major three components which are at interplay. And as you can imagine, you know, as you know, you have all three working together, things became a little bit complicated because you know, whenever you, you have more than two bodies, you know, in the system interacting with each other, it became a little bit, you know, uh, could become a chaotic, you know, quickly, you know, if it's not well done. So today I'm going to share uh, some of the experiences um, we have learned in the past few years uh, doing uh, AI application in domain of ALP and conversational AI. I don't want you to, to be constrained to ALP and conversational AI. Really, this is about like general learning in the process of plug, you know, plugging AI into uh, commercial applications, you know, business use cases. So the agenda for me is uh, pretty simple, three steps. Um, first, you need to solve the right problem, right? You have to find the right problem, identify it, and then try to solve it. Second, you have to find the right AI solution for that problem, right? You might have the best AI solution, but it may not be right for that problem you have. And lastly, you have to put that into the right system, which is um, scalable, which is uh, customized to your own ecosystem. You know, uh, it might be uh, great uh, if you um, if uh, if it, you look at other companies' uh, solution in this case, you know, but. Uh, it may not work in your own you know, system. So you really have to um, customize it to your own system and make it work. So um, in terms of problem solving, really I think you know, um, we jump to the solution too quickly as um, put it, uh, by uh, Russell Eckhoff, right? Uh, often we fail because we solve the wrong problem, not because you know, we, uh, you know, uh, so, getting the solution to the uh, right problem is critical, you know, according to him. And that turned out to be the case, you know, for many, uh, according to many of my own experiences, you know, um, that's actually um, very important uh, at the st early stage of your project, you have to think about, you know, what are you trying to solve? So solving the right problem turned out to be a critical uh, uh, lesson, uh, especially in our case, you know, um, we look at all kinds of problems uh, at the end of the day, uh, we find a couple use cases at Uber, which uh, turned out that to be um, great for AI. Uh, and also uh, in terms of timing, that's also a good timing for us to do it. So the first one is around customer support. In this case, you know, uh, imagine that you are using Uber, but somehow uh, your uh, trip cannot be completed because uh, your credit card expired, right? You want to update your credit card, but somehow uh, it doesn't work out you had to contact some customer support agent and get help from them in order to get back to uh, the track, right? Uh, so it turned out that, you know, given the scale of Uber business, uh, we receive millions of tickets every single week. Um, among all these tickets, you know, the complexity of this is huge. Uh, it actually um, can be composed into thousands of different issue types. And, um, and that um, also consists thousands of potential solutions to those problems, right? Um, you name it, all kinds of problems uh, you can imagine, right? Fair problem, you know, uh, trip completion, you know, driver rider attitude, all kinds of problems. So this is really a huge space for decision making, uh, especially when you think of humans, you know, when you are encountering with thousands of issue types, that's really uh, difficult. And it's, uh, as a result, it's error prone and it typically take a lot of uh, human effort. It's, it's not that high efficiency process. So we want to basically plug machine learning and AI into this to uh, speed out such a process so that uh, human agents can become more accurate and, uh, higher, and achieve higher efficiency. Another area we found is uh, around in-app communication. This is, uh, this is mostly used when driver and riders are trying to connect with each other during pickup time. So uh, typically you will message each other in order to uh, figure out where you are, right? So it, it's extremely painful to type messages on phones, especially for uh, drivers. Imagine that you are driving in a busy city. Uh, I don't know where you are, but maybe, um, maybe you're in New York, right? Uh, if you are driving in uh, New York at 5 p.m. in the afternoon, right? Um, and you are trying to you know, um, navigate through the traffic, you know, that, that would be super painful to type messages on your phone to, uh, to reply to your driver, to, to your uh, rider. But on the other hand, you do have the need because you, know, you want to connect with each other. So uh, this is another area where I identify that you know, it's, it would be super helpful to have something 
automated for this process to make life a lot uh, a little easier for drivers. Another area is one of voice in, uh, interface. Um, as you know, the study shows that you know actually close to seventy percent drivers prefer to have hands-free phones while they are driving. Right? They have to accomplish a lot of tasks as Uber drivers, but at the same time, they just uh, they are tied to the uh, steering wheel. Right? They don't really have uh, that much time and energy to uh, operate on the phone. So if they can talk talk to the phone using voice modality and accomplish the task, that would be great. Uh, so those are the three areas uh, we identify as um, potential business uh, opportunities. And uh, from a very high level, um, some of the criteria we recognized over the past few years are this. Uh, in order to find the right problem, typically these problems involve decision making under uh, uncertainty, right? Um, but it also should have certain patterns for your models to learn. Otherwise, uh, it's, uh, we cannot do anything. Um, also, it should be within the reach of AI technology, right? Uh, given the technology we have right now, uh, it should be durable uh, in terms of uh, tech. Otherwise, um, there's no way for us to reach there. And uh, the last two points is around a uh, customer pain point. It should uh, really solve some uh, problem for driver, uh, for customers. Otherwise, uh, nobody's going to buy it. And lastly, uh, it has to bring business values uh, to, in order to make it sustainable. So once we've identified the problem, uh, now it's uh, the time to find the, find the right solution for it. Um, so this can be pretty overwhelming because you know, if you think about uh, AI solutions, we are talking about many different dimensions, right? Uh, are you talking about traditional algorithms? Are you talking about deep learning algorithms? Are you talk, uh, talking about unsupervised, supervised, you know, generating models, you know, reinforced learning models? Which one are you talking about? You know, uh, what's the right solution for your problem? Are you talking about convolution nets, recurrent nets, you know, uh, even transformer-based architectures? Are you talking about you know, um, doing transfer learning or are you thinking of training from scratch? For conversational AI, you know, are you talking about modularized design or end-to-end -end training because conversational AI systems typically composed, are composed of a couple of different modules, right? Do you want to do individual modularized training or do you want to do everything in a single gigantic you know, model? So uh, all, uh, all kinds of decision making to make here. Um, it could be pretty overwhelming as I mentioned. Um, today I'm going to share two sort of pieces of, uh, uh, of dimensions where uh, we look at this problem. Uh, one is around the model performance uh, versus data size. This is a very well known plot. I think many of you probably saw it um, uh, in the past. And uh, Andrew Yin specifically uh, mentioned this, you know, in multiple places. This is probably one of his favorite plots. So it's about, you know, uh, as you scale your data size, your model performance uh, become better and better. But uh, the uh, slope uh, varies for different kinds of models, right? Depending on your model capacity. And uh, the general idea is that, you know, as you have more and more data, you should try more and more powerful models because you have uh, larger capacity to, uh, to learn the patterns and eventually it will win. But uh, if you don't have enough data, you are going to overfit such models and it's not going to perform as well compared to uh, smaller models, right? Uh, that's the general uh, message. Another one uh, is uh, often uh, not uh, paid too much attention to is around the data size versus task complexity. Really, when you take a task, you have to think about how complex your task and then use that to sort of uh, infer how much data you will need to collect in order to solve the problem. So that turns out to be critical because uh, often um, we start out by collecting data without looking at how, uh, what is the problem we are solving and how much data do we think we really need. So I'm going to illustrate those points uh, through uh, the examples I mentioned. The first one is around customer support. Uh, at Uber, we build something called a, a CODA, Customer Obsession Ticket Assistant. The idea is simple. We want to uh, recommend um, solutions to customer support agents using models, using machine learning models, so that uh, they basically can um, pass, get past the process of looking up all the information, then make a decision. And instead, they can click on the suggestions uh, in terms of issue types and solutions so that they can actually solve those tickets faster. Um, this is a little bit um, 
background about the customer support platform at Uber. Uh, it all started from user. When something went wrong, typically user uh, select a certain flow node, which indicates what kind of problem it is, write some message, and then that creates a ticket. And that ticket gets routed to the customer support agents. And then the agent need to look up information, select the issue type, select some action to take. For example, maybe re uh, reimburse $5, and, uh, stuff like that and then write a response using some templates to get back to the customer, inform the customer what kind of action has been taken. So this closed a single loop of interaction. Uh, and it can go on for multiple, um, uh, multiple steps. So uh, when we look at this problem, we, uh, we basically ask ourselves, you know, where we are in those codes, right? Uh, uh, excuse me. Um, Bill, is somebody typing on the um, keyboard? Can, can somebody mute yourself when you are typing? Uh, hold on a second, let me see. Okay, go ahead. Okay, sure. So basically um, the question sort of, we ask ourselves, right? Uh, where are we on these plots, right? Um, and it turns out that you know, our task, if you think about uh, the problem of customer support, right? It's kind of difficult, but it's not as crazy as something like ImageNet, right? You don't have millions of potential uh, classes to classify. Uh, so for our, in our case, we have a well-categorized issue types. We have a, um, a good bank of uh, reply templates, which we can use. Basically, our target is on the order of thousands, maybe tens of thousands, but, but it's not as crazy as uh, ImageNet. And also, we have a lot of information about what happened during the trip, right? Uh, we kind of have the features to extract the patterns. So the task, in terms of task complexity, uh, we kind of are in the intermediate region, if you, um, broadly speaking, if you want to put it on, on somewhere. And in terms of data size, you know, how much data do we have? It turns out we have a lot of data because um, agents are uh, solving those tickets every single day, right? Whatever they do, their actions become our labels. What they do in the past basically they can um, be used as labels for this task. So basically, if you think about it, we have basically as much data as we want because agents are generating data for us, you know, um, all the time. So uh, as a result, as you can imagine, basically we have the luxury to try the most powerful model we have, uh, given that we we know that we have uh, pretty much unlimited data. So as a result, we basically uh, know that uh, we want to get, a, get to deep learning models eventually. So we tried out a classical model to see how it works in this case. And the first model we tried out is called a point-wise ranking. It's basically taking all the ticket information and the uh, uh, target class you want to try to predict, and then do some feature engineering in to give engineer the cosine similarity features, and then run through a binary classification model to decide whether that ticket belong to a particular class prediction, right? And then we make a recommendation at the end of the day, pick the top three contact types and the reply templates. These stand for the issue type of the ticket, as well as what kind of uh, reply solution should be sent out to the customer. So those uh, top three recommendations are surfaced to the customer support agents, and they can choose one of those. So that's the first version of purely a classical solution. We know it's, uh, we, we want to test it out. We want to see whether it works. And it turns out it was great. We reduced the handle time by 10% uh, on average through A-B testing. But we know that you know, we have so much data, we shouldn't stop here. So we basically uh, uh, quickly go to the deep learning architecture, try it out, all kinds of potential deep learning uh, models we can have. Uh, we basically come up with a generic uh, encoder, combiner, and decoder architecture. Uh, in this case, uh, you can send all kinds of features through uh, in different kind of encoders uh, specific for that kind of features. And then you combine all these features together and decode them and then generate your outputs, right? In this case, we might want to predict the sequence of uh, issue types. We might want to predict the uh, reply templates. Um, basically, you can decode that uh, according to your need. This is very generic, can be used in many applications. And we tried out a couple of different uh, modeling uh, architectures. Specifically, um, for dealing with text, we tried out a both the word, uh, word level convolution neural nets, 
You can also try it out on the character level, which is uh, nice in terms of uh, dealing with um, a lot of vocabulary words. And you can also do recurrent neural nets because that's natural for sequence of words. You can also do a uh, combination of convolution and recurrent, sort of more like a hierarchical uh, uh, net. So you can do all kinds of combinations. And uh, at the end of the day, we decide that a word of convolution neural net is the one which achieve the best, uh, best performance in terms of both the trade-off of model complexity as well as uh, training time. So when we compare the deep learning model and the classical model on the task of type selection and reply selection, we find that uh, uh, the second generation deep learning model is consistently better than the first generation on all metrics, um, whether it's type accuracy, reply accuracy, or even the combined accuracy for both tasks. Uh, for example, for combined accuracy, it's actually 7% uh, uh, better compared to the uh, you know, V1 model, which is uh, relatively 15% better uh, for the task, which is a lot of improvement for this task already. So um, as a quick sort of summary here, um, basically um, for the CODA model, right, CODA system, we realize that we are on the spectrum towards the right side for the uh, data size. Uh, we basically have a lot of data. And for the task uh, we have, I believe uh, we don't really you know, uh, need a you know, huge amount of data, but uh, we can afford that. So we really, we are in a uh, situation where we really have the luxury of, you know, data is enough for this task. Um, that's kind of the key message coming uh, out of this um, experiment. And the second, um, the second problem I want to talk uh, to you about is uh, around a one-click chat. So it's a smart reply system with beautiful drivers. On the left shows the conventional typing uh, system. On the right shows the smart reply templates surfacing to the drivers, and drivers can uh, click those. So I'm going to show you a video. Uh, hopefully it works, uh, which is a video demo showing how the smart reply system works in reality. All right, this illustrates the case that um, the, during the pickup period, driver and riders were able to find each other um, simply through using uh, smart reply, especially for drivers. You know, the driver didn't need to type any uh, message, single message. Uh, it's, the whole conversation is accomplished through typing, uh, selecting smart replies. So when we, uh, we, we were uh, facing this problem, right? Uh, we look at the problem, we uh, think about, you know, what kind of smart reply solutions we want to build. Of course, you know, the first thing coming to mind is Gmail smart reply, right? That's like the golden standard for the industry. Um, but as we look into it, uh, it became interesting because we realized, soon realized that uh, we have unique challenges that's, that's different from what Gmail uh, have, right? Uh, in this case, in Gmail's case, right, uh, you have typically pretty formal writings and people uh, have formal sentences, people have, um, um, pretty long messages in uh, emails, while in messaging uh, platforms, you have uh, something like this, you know, right? Where are you, you know, right? Uh, you have typos, you have short messages, you have uh, abbreviations, you have something like I'm Washington for you, right? Uh, if you Google it, this is what you get. Um, so we don't really know what uh, that means. So it's really unique in the sense that, you know, um, the message body itself is short and it's very dense. 
So when we look at this problem, right, uh, we think about a task complexity so that we want to figure out how much data do we need. And we soon realize that, you know, we're uh, nowhere close in terms of task complexity compared to Gmail, right? In Gmail, you can talk about anything, uh, your life, your work, anything. But in Uber's OCC case, one click chat case, right, um, people typically talk about pickup, right? You try to find each other uh, between driver and riders. So the top kind of topics people can discuss really is rather limited. So as a result, we, um, we realized that, um, yeah, we can basically start from uh, collecting a small amount of data to test it out, see whether it works before we collect a lot of data. This really motivated us to sort of start with a very simple um, uh, approach. Uh, so we break it into two steps. We first do intent detection, and then we do reply retrieval. Uh, for example, uh, a message of where are you right now can be classified as where are you intent. And based on that where are you, we can re retrieve all kinds of popular re responses to that. And in Uber's case, there's not a whole lot of different um, templates you can use because um, as a driver, there's only a few potential uh, responses for where are you, right? You are either on the way to, drive to the rider or you are stuck in traffic, you are already arrived, you know, there's only a couple of things you can think of as you resp uh, respond to such a, um, uh, a message. So for intent detection, we basically start out with a simple uh, approach, as I mentioned, because we know that the task itself is uh, uh, pretty constrained in the business domain. So we start with unsupervised learning train a doctor vector model, which map the uh, message body to a dense vector. In this case, because it's unsupervised, we can take as much data as we want, right? We take millions of Uber internal data and train that to train a doctor vector model to map the message. And then uh, we use the thousands of label data we collected. For this label data, we know the intent of each of these messages, and we, we map them to the uh, embedding space we trained from step one. And then we calculate centroid for each of these intent clusters. And then we use, uh, we basically use those intent clusters as a representation for each of those intents. And then we calculate for any new incoming message, we calculate the distance of this new incoming message and each of the intent cluster centroid. And uh, in the embedding space, we basically can classify that message into the nearest one uh, in terms of intent cluster, right? That's uh, the simplest algorithm you can think of. It's called a nearest neighbor classifier. Uh, it turns out that that works amazingly well. Um, I'm Washington for you can be classified as I'm waiting for you after uh, doing this. Of course, the story won't be complete, so we tried deep learning as well. And uh, it turns out that you know deep learning model doesn't have a uh, an advantage over the uh, nearest neighbor classifier. And the reason for that is again because we start simple, right? We didn't collect a lot of data. We collect only thousands of label data, and that's good enough in terms of accuracy for us. But at that point, I, uh, deep learning model is not showing uh, an advantage yet, simply because we are not in the regime of big data yet. So this is where we learn for the second use case where we don't have a very complex task. We have kind of simple task to deal with. Uh, and uh, given the amount of data we collected, uh, we are not in the regime where deep learning is showing the power yet. Instead, uh, deep learning is performing on par with some of the you know, traditional uh, machine learning models. But the performance is good enough, so we decide to pursue that route. Um, lastly, I'm going to talk you, to you about the conversational AI applications we have at Uber. Um, a lot of stuff is still ongoing, so I'm going to um, basically uh, skipping a lot of the details instead of just show you some of the uh, high level stuff uh, as well uh, one thing I can talk about is the molecular research project uh, we are doing uh, on neural uh, language correction so I'm going to touch upon that as well so if you uh, are familiar with conversational AI so uh, this this field has been there around for a while so it's a pretty mature field um, on a high level there are generally two categories of, of approaches one is this um, modulized approach I'm showing on the top. Basically, uh, you have speech coming into the system, you have speech coming out, right? This plot is, uh, this uh, figure is neglecting the speech recognition and a TTS system, but you can imagine they're there. Your input X is basically some text coming from speech recognition, and then you do language understanding, you do uh, dialogue state tracking, and your system decides some policy in terms of what to do, 
and then you uh, do generation language generation to send something back to your customer, right? In the middle, maybe you need to access some data, uh, uh, some database in order to retrieve information or execute some actions as you uh, carry out the dialogue policy. Um, this is a very standard approach in the industry. Pretty much all the commercial virtual assistant systems are using this. Um, Alexa, you know, Google Assistant, um, uh, Cortana, you name it. Um, for academia, however, uh, uh, it is uh, another route. A lot of research has been concentrated on the fully end-to-end -end system where you have your um, text coming in, text coming out, and then you have a single statistical model. Nowadays, it's mostly neural net models, and this uh, single neural net model typically uh, does everything uh, in the above, right? Uh, it uh, try to solve everything in a single shot. Oh, uh, as you can imagine, this will require a lot more data uh, compared to the top one, uh, and it's mostly right now in still in uh, sort of research phase. Uh, um, most of research uh, going on uh, in this field, but not so much going on in terms of pushing it into production because it's not simply not mature yet. Uh, for Uber, we take the first route. Basically, we have a modularized approach, and we identify a few use cases where we want to enable voice interface for uh, drivers. The first one is around dispatch. When drivers uh, get some uh, dispatch uh, alerts, they want, uh, the, uh, we want them to talk to the app in order to accomplish it instead of uh, walking on the phone using their uh, fingers. So uh, let me show you a quick demo on that. The second one is around pick up communication. As you can see in the second uh, use case, um, driver and riders are communicating through voice, right? Um, people don't need to even need to uh, select anything or typing on the phone anymore. Just talk to the app and then the system will uh, extract your message and send it back to the customers. So one problem we encounter when we do the, uh, this uh, voice enabled reply uh, or message is um, ASI errors, right? Uh, as you can see on the top, you know, this is a typical message people might send. Ask her which side you can, right? Um, the model will run through, a, say, a recurrent net try to extract the message body, right? Uh, it will start with uh, which side you can, and ask her will become other class, simply get discarded after the model, right? Because uh, this, this is not the phrase you want to send. Instead, you want to send which side you can. But as the system goes through the speech recognition system, um, what you actually see is uh, typically something like this. Ask her which side you can, or ask her which side you can, Ask her which side you can, you know, ask, ask her which side you can, you know, um, contains all kinds of errors at different places, right? Uh, the trouble for this is that if you take the first uh, hypothesis coming from ASR, then run it through the model, you will get something like, you know, B I I I tag for this message. Then it will basically become Oscar, which side you come. That will be the message sent out um, to the customer, which uh, is less than ideal, right? So um, the neural language correction model aims at looking at uh, all these ASR corrections and try to recover the correct case. As you can imagine, you can do all kinds of things. The first approach uh, we think of is sentence level ranking, where you can rank different hypotheses from this best and then just choose one. In this case, for example, the model will choose the third one as a whole, ask her which side you can. So it's less than perfect, but it's better because now uh, cam uh, instead of cam is picked. So this will be sent uh, through the model. The model will basically pick an index from the best. As you can imagine, this task is kind of simple because you only need to select among all the best. In this case, you might have 20 best, but that's like uh, the space you're working in. The second approach you can imagine is word level ranking, right? Now you can align all your best on the word level and then pick word from individual uh, positions, right? You might pick the, ask her for, uh, from, the third, uh, from the third hypothesis, and then you might pick which side you can 
from the first hypothesis. Then you make up a message by combining all of these, right? This is water level ranking. Uh, as you uh, can imagine, the complexity for this is getting uh, a little bit bigger because you have to choose individual words from each position. Uh, and lastly, you can do uh, something fancy, right? You can do word level generation. For example, you can encode all of your messages through an encoder and then generate all kinds of hidden states and then do a tension on top of it and then generate a word at an individual position, right? This is purely generation. It's not a picking words. It's not picking um, sentences. It's generating words one by one. So the task complexity for this is uh, much higher compared to the previous one. So this is where basically the task complexity was a data size you know, plot coming into play, right? And now look at this curve, right? How much data you would need for generation versus uh, sentence selection it would be different, right? Um, so we tried our best, we collected a, a lot of data, and it turned out that we didn't collect enough data. Uh, that's shown in the performance. So we look at the mes error message, sort of error rate reduction from the message, we find that the sentence level ranking is actually working the best, while the generation task uh, is uh, actually working uh, the worst. It's actually less than the baseline we started with because uh, we simply don't have enough data to reach the point that uh, generation start to work yet. So this is a big lesson we learned, right? Uh, given the amount of data, you really should look at where your uh, task capacity is so that you know how much data you need. In this case, um, we conclude that we collect enough data for ranking on the sentence level, but not enough data for generation yet. So just summarize, you know, um, there's a lot of things you should look at, but uh, I would argue that you know, two of the things you should look at is the complexity of the task and amount of data that's available to you. That will give you uh, a huge level in terms of where you should go when you, as you build a model, or if your model is not working, what else you should look into. So lastly, I'm going to touch upon this briefly. Um, just quick, uh, quickly check on the time. Uh, how, how, how am I doing on time, Bill? Um, I assume I have... Yeah, few, you have a few, few more minutes. minutes. Yeah, okay. you're, you're doing good. You have a few more minutes. Okay, okay I will quickly uh, run through the last uh, point I want to make, which is how do you put AI into the right system? Um, then conclude my talk. So this is a perception of a machine learning system, right? You have your ML code, that's cool, that's fancy, but that's not the, uh, everything. Actually, you have everything else around it. Your ML code is really a small piece uh, uh, in, sort of uh, encapsulated in a huge infrastructure system supporting it. Um, so when you talk about you know, putting ML into a system, it's really uh, challenging because it has all kinds of issues. For example, you, you have system dependencies, as I showed, right? It uh, depends on what kind of infrastructure you have. You have data dependencies depending on what kind of upstreaming data you have, right? If somebody make a change there, maybe things will break in the downstream. And you have feedback loop because your model will um, influence how your system is making predictions for future, and that predicted data is coming back to your training data in the next batch, right? And it will sort of have this you know, feedback uh, loop to bias your model towards itself. And your dynamics in your system is changing, right? Your business is uh, shifting every single day. Your underlying data distribution is changing over time, right? Uh, how, how do you catch uh, up that? Uh, model interoperability is a big issue because sometimes things break, but how do you know, uh, figure out you know, uh, what's going on, right? Uh, how to debug and uh, figure out a solution for that? All kinds of issues, but today I'm going to touch upon the first point, which is system de dependency. Really, you want to make your AI system to be customized to your own system. So for Uber, we have this uh, issue of sort of traditional versus deep learning stacks because before deep learning, everything is working on Spark and we have clusters of G CPUs to do the Spark distributed training. But deep learning stack is different, right? You have TensorFlow, you have PyTorch, it's running on GPUs for training. So how do you combine the best of the uh, two worlds in order to make it work, right? So eventually we come up with this, this idea of combining Spark with the, uh, TensorFlow. Basically we have Spark job for pre-processing, we have deep learning training uh, for, um, we have TensorFlow for deep learning training, and then we combine them uh, in a unified fashion. Specifically for serving, we uh, basically treated the TensorFlow model as another transformer in the Spark pipeline and um, just embed it into the unified Spark pipeline and then serve it using the Spark concept of uh, uh, Java. 
So basically using Java as a common interface to talk to both of these um, uh, stacks. That's uh, our way to solve this problem and it solves a great need for our real-time requests. And also in terms of scalability of training, it's uh, work out uh, nicely. So I'll quickly wrap up my talk. Um, today I um, basically um, want to convey uh, the message that you, know, you, you want to find the right problem before you start your uh, AI uh, sort of journey. And uh, you want to find the right AI solution, which typically is very difficult. Uh, it involves a lot of different moving uh, variables. Um, I'm suggesting you look at how difficult your task is and how much data you need, and that will inform you what kind of model you need in terms of complexity. And lastly, you need to figure out your infrastructure yourself, right? Uh, this is something highly customized uh, according to a different company. Um, you have to make your system to be infrastructure aware to make sure it really uh, works in the long run. So that's all I have. Thank you so much for your attention. I think I might have time to take up some questions. Great. I think it's in the chat window. Uh, you have uh, a couple of questions. OK. Uh, do you uh, want to read those? Or, uh, yeah, yeah uh, I can read it. Um, if you open up the chat window, you probably can see by yourself too. But anyway, I can oh, read it. Oh, OK, OK. Let me Hi, uh, which deep learning models were you using to compare your internal discovery with the basic NNC model? Yeah, so in that case, we compared it to um, word convolution neural nets and uh, uh, character convolution neural nets. So it's uh, mostly a convolution uh, model, but with, uh, with um, different units in terms of uh, model uh, architecture, I think it's right here, yeah. It's a uh, word level and a uh, character level convolution neural nets. <laughs> Cool. Uh, there's another question. It's actually this way in the Q and A session. It's asking the slides will okay. be sent out at the end of the session. Are you able to share the slides? Yeah, I think I can share the slides. Okay. Yeah, if you share the slides, I will uh, have the link and then send it to everyone. Okay. I think we have one more question from Kishore. Do you have context-based spell ch check? Correction in your model? If yes, which vector are you using? I'm not sure what you mean by context based spell correction, but basically, this model is doing that. Uh, it's exactly doing sort of context aware, contextual aware um, spell uh, correction. But what, in addition to that, we're also doing the language understanding at the same time, right? Um, so we are not only uh, trying to correct the message body, but also we want to uh, do the tagging and language understanding at the same time because uh, eventually uh, it's a combination of these two makes the system work, right? You want to extract a message. So the message body itself tells you what kind of message it is. Tagging task will tell you where do you extract a message. So you have to really do both in order to make it work. I hope that answers your question. Uh, that's a good question. Whether using BERT models would be better compared to uh, the simplest classification task? I, uh, I don't think so, because in this case, it's really not about the model capacity. So uh, convolution neural nets are, are performing on par with uh, the uh, nearest neighbor classifier. Instead, I think it's more about the data we, uh, size. We, don't, we didn't collect enough data for that case yet in order to make the deep learning models uh, having an advantage. So in this case, if we have enough data, I think, you know, BERT might um, work out, you know, better, right? Um, how many intents to, does the intent detection system deal with? So in this case, we are having uh, intent on auto handles. So we don't have as crazy as uh, Gmail, right? In Gmail's case, uh, they have like millions of intents. We're only dealing with handles. So that's why um, it's a lot simpler task. 
Oh, in in uh, uh, in uh, um, intent detection case, we have thousands of label data um, because that, at that point we uh, don't know how it works. So we basically uh, try it out and collect um, a, more like a pilot, you know, test set of data to try it out and it turns out that that works nicely. Cool, all right. It seems like that's uh, all the questions. Is there any? Okay, uh, this is one more question, I guess. Uh, uh, so why not pick pretty model for same? Um, I'm not sure about this question. The question is that uh, ML component is only a small component of the whole system. So why not pick pre-trained model for the same? Yeah, even if you use pre-trained model, right, you still need to uh, adapt that to your own customized code uh, or any problem, right? Uh, you cannot just take the pre-trained and say, BERT, uh, which does everything for you, right? You have to adapt it and fine tune it to your own task. So still you have to have your own glue code for your machine learning model. Um, what is the minimal system configuration used for training? I'm not sure about that question, um, but uh, I'm assuming you're asking what kind of training uh, sort of stack we are using. So for Spark, uh, for, for pre-processing, we are using, Python, uh, we are using uh, Apache Spark uh, to do the training. And um, typically you run that on, I don't know, hundreds of uh, CPUs. Uh, for deep learning training, we are doing it on GPUs. So you know, that typically involves you know, a couple of GPUs, depending on how much you have. Um, between PyTorch and TensorFlow, is there a preference? Yes, uh, for us, TensorFlow is a better choice so far because uh, we can talk to TensorFlow models using Java, uh, using the uh, Java naive interface. Uh, I'm not 100% sure about PyTorch yet, using how do you talk to PyTorch using Java yet. So that's another, uh, area I'm not 100% familiar with. So TensorFlow is a sort of default preference here. Do you do any anomaly detection, um, uh, malicious activity detection? If yes, which algorithm do you use? I don't do that, but some of my colleagues at Uber um, um, do that. Um, and, and they are, I, th I believe they are using both classic approaches as well as some of the neural nets. Uh, one of them actually went some of these famous anomaly detection time series competition called M4. I, f I don't know exactly what it stands for, but um, uh, I, I know one colleague who is very good at this. Uh, he, he actually um, nailed a competition on this. So he's certainly an expert on this. What are the some in other